Welcome back, AP. So, all right, I'm going to try and breathe. I don't know if you know this. Well, you probably don't because you weren't here. I recorded a, your first flip yesterday, and it was 26 minutes long. And it was 26 minutes long of awful. Now, the biggest thing that I want to try and get across is it's just a simple overview of the Middle Ages in general, focusing on the late Middle Ages, all right? And the key concepts in the late Middle Ages that we're going to be focusing on is the Black Death and how it affected Europe. We're going to be focusing on the Hundred Years' War and how it affected Europe and nationalistic tensions between England and France. We're going to talk about uh, the Great Schism and the climate of the Catholic Church. And then we're going to leave off with just the general calamity and the general, like, life of peasantry and citizens going into the Renaissance, right? Because we know Renaissance means rebirth. And it means a rebirth of the old ancient ways. So to get started off, let's go ahead and discuss that, right? The ancient period that we know of as history, like history disregarding prehistory, goes from about 5000 BC up till about, <clears throat> excuse me, 456 AD, all right? So that means going from about the establishment of the Mesopotamians and the Sumerians, and then going all the way up to ancient Rome in late antiquity, right? So that is going to the, the fall of Rome is going to mark the beginning of the Middle Ages. The reason why they're called the Middle Ages is yeah, they're in the middle of that big timeline that we know as modern time, like or excuse me, that we know as world history. But remember, we're focusing on the history of Europe, okay? So after Rome fell due to several different factors, mainly it being so large and unmanageable, that it led to emperors splitting it in half and then trying to section it off into different provinces and things like that. Also, they had an inflation crisis under Diocletian when they actually had coins that were made up of mostly filler, garbage metals, and not even so much silver anymore. Not, and the biggest key factor that led to their fall was the invasions by barbarians. Now, some historians don't even call these invasions anymore. They call them a migratory pattern. Now, a lot of this has to do with the fact that barbarian cultures actually have always lived throughout Europe, and the Romans were just busy conquering them one at a time. Different barbarian groups include Ostrogoths, Visigoths, Huns, Vandals, Magyars, uh, Anglos, Saxons, that then eventually bred together to become Anglo-Saxons. So as you can tell, Europe started out a lot like most other areas. One dominant culture, and then a lot of other smaller factionized cultures around. Now remember, barbarian is actually a very prejudiced word because the Romans would just use that word to basically refer to anybody that wasn't them. And the word barbarian comes from the word barbarous, which means to battle, because the Romans couldn't understand what they were saying. All right, so anyway, going forward though, when Rome finally falls, then that's going to lead to the Middle Ages. Now, the biggest misconceptions about the Middle Ages, so keep start off with the fact that the Middle Ages aren't what you think they are. The fact that they're called the Dark Ages is a very unacademic thing to say anymore because the Islamic empires after 600 AD with the rise of the Prophet Muhammad actually had a huge expansion conquering most of the known Roman Empire at the time, including much of North Africa, what you know as the Middle East today, and then going all the way up into Spain, all right? One really important thing about this Islamic domination is the fact that as they conquered, they actually had a growth in their intelligent life. So they actually had it on massive amounts of mathematics, science, medicine. They explained the concept of zero to the Westerners, not to mention the fact that they also held on to what would once be considered lost intelligence. They actually took the ideas of the ancient Greek philosophers like Aristotle and translated them into their colloquial Arabic. Now, colloquial meaning common or intelligent language. So they actually translated those works back and they were held in different places in Spain, like the Andalus in a place called Toledo. And that actually is going to help lead into the Renaissance when we rediscover those works from them. Now, also it wasn't considered the Dark Ages because there was a Western society that existed all the way up until 14, like the 1450s AD. So going all the way into the late Middle Ages, the Byzantine Empire, which actually was the remaining eastern half of the Roman Empire. Okay. Now, after the Romans fell, that when we say Rome fell, we mean the city-state of Rome and the western half, western half of it fell. Okay, and then that means that the eastern half continued to prosper. 
they actually did a lot of major and inex inexplicably amazing things. They were the end stop of the Silk Road. They served as the defense mechanism of the West from the Eastern empires that were trying to surge forward. They actually protected the West from people like the Seljuk Turks and a lot of other the, barbar the barbarian kingdoms and the per rise of the old Persians coming after the Hellenistic fall that were going this way. They did a lot of great things. I'm trying to breathe. I'm trying to slow down. So they were militarily advanced. They invented Greek fire. They had literature and art and all these things that aren't very middle-aged like. So the Byzantine Empire continued to prosper. And they're also going to be the big motivation behind the Crusades. But we're not going to get into that because it's not on the AP test. So, but let's talk about the Middle Ages in general. So the Middle Ages in general, of course, started with the fall of Rome. And they're going to last from 500 AD all the way up until 1450 AD. Those, the Middle Ages is broken into three different time sections or periods. It goes the, or excuse me, excuse me. It goes the early Middle Ages, which goes from 500 AD to 1000 AD. And let's go ahead and talk about that a little bit. The early Middle Ages is really known as a time of consolidation. It comes to when these barbarian tribes, especially the Franks, are gonna be like consolidating themselves into what you would call a kingdom. All right. So there's going to be ruling bodies, a king or a monarch. There's going to be tribal conflicts and things like that going on later on. But the very important thing about consolidation is that it brings about intelligence, general welfare and health. Right. So the Merovingians are going to have their own thing. And then the Carolingians, which is Charlemagne, which I'm I hope some of you have heard of before. Charlemagne is going to expand the Frankish kingdom after Clovis, leading to a gigantic empire that is actually the biggest the world had ever seen up until that point since the fall of Rome. This is also going to be a very important thing because Charlemagne was crowned Emperor of Christendom. Now, this is going to be a union between a government and a military, well, excuse me, a government slash military and the Catholic Church. The Pope at the time is actually going to crown him King, uh, Emperor of Christendom, and he is going to be, become the shield of the Catholic Church, right? And to protect it from a lot of the barbarians that were on the outsides. And then also not to mention the fact, excuse me, that he's going to serve as a grand flag of the church to help convert a lot of these other barbarian tribes. Because a lot of the old customs that these barbarians use, like paganism and sacrifice and animal sacrifice and Things like that were becoming much more outdated, and the appeal of the Christian ideologies actually like, was very, very fruitful to them. The ideas of living a good life and being rewarded in the afterlife was great. Now, also in the early Middle Ages, we're going to see the establishment of a system called feudalism. Feudalism is going to be really, really concrete and solid after the Charlemagne finally dies, all right? So when Charlemagne dies, he actually left his empire to a lot of his sons. His sons couldn't really manage it effectively, leaving it open to other barbarian invasions. So what would happen is these rich lords of the land, hence landlord, would actually own these large plots of land, and then there would be people that protected that land called vassals or knights, and then underneath those people were the people that worked the land, hence like the manor system, right? We're going to get to that a little bit more in the High Middle Ages in about two seconds. So that's going to lead to the feudal system. The serfs would work for their stay, the vassals would protect for their stay, the lords would actually make money off the land and then pay it in tribute back to the king. It was a system of land ownership and protection, right? So going forward, though, moving into, of course, the High Middle Ages, the High Middle Ages were seen as much more of a prosperous period out of that thousand-year time span. It is the best of those three periods. It actually saw a rise in things like art. It got a rise in things like monasteries and convents, and the Catholic Church began to grow. And the Catholic Church is also going to become a very big focal point of a thing called scholasticism, where actual formal education is going to begin to come back. The popes and the priests and the monks and the nuns are going to be taught to read and write, and then they are going to begin to formally educate people in their towns and outlying areas in their What's the word I'm looking for? Like a church body? They're uh, sort of like a P. Uh, one of y'all will tell me later on. But um, anyway, so they're going to begin to like actually educate people. The, also, the state is going to begin to grow. And the high middle ages is what you actually refer to as the nation states are going to begin to pop up, right? Nation states in the terms of formal, what you would call countries. So the big countries, of course, were England, France, and the Holy Roman Empire. Those are the big three, all right? So England was consolidated in 1066 under William of Normandy, a.k.a. William the Conqueror at the Battle of Hastings. And then France is going to be consolidated later on due to, through a lot of other small landholding nobles. 
And then over on the other side, the HRE, the Holy Roman Empire, is going to help be consolidated by several ruling families and then also the Catholic Church. It's considered like the church country. All right, so anyway, it's what you consider Germany now. Y'all have probably seen some of that in that 1645 map, right? Well, the High Middle Ages was also a really prosperous point because now we're getting closer to what we actually need to talk about. It was a period of good climate. The harvests were very, very good, and there were plentiful amounts of harvests of things like wheat, barley, grain, and hay. So this led to very, very good lifestyles. This led to very good health of animals, livestock, people. And when people actually lead good lives and eat healthier and do better, they actually end up having a population increase, right? So better life, better diet, healthier, more kids, right? So these peasants are going to begin to start moving into some of these more urban areas and some of these other like larger landholding estates to find work, to find protection. Population is going to begin to dramatically increase, all right? So that's the high middle ages in a nutshell. Now going forward though, again, so in the high middle, remember in the late middle ages we've got consolidation, Charlemagne, all that stuff. Uh, and then in the high middle ages we've got uh, the establishment of nation states. We've got the ideas of like these little countries grouping together and these countries getting bigger and bigger and more powerful, formal military, things like that. Also, the High Middle Ages was the home to the Crusades, so like some of the first formal military actions by these uh, big <clears throat> groups. Then going forward, we have the crisis of the Late Middle Ages, all right? The Late Middle Ages honestly served as a point where it almost destroyed Europe in a whole, okay? It was first and foremost started off with a dramatic dip climate. Now, a lot of you said, well, wait a minute, the climate was really, really positive. Well, actually, I don't know if you knew this or not, but some historians believe that we are still actually slightly coming off the edge of what was known as a mini ice age that started in 1300, okay? So there was a dramatic dip in climate during after 1300 AD. Now, what that's going to lead to is a high, um, a die-off of crops and goods, all of this hay, barley, and oats, uh, grains, resources that were coming from the, these large feudal manors, they're going to begin to die. And that means that all these people that have now, population increased, right? All these people that have now been born during the high middle ages, they're beginning to die off because they're actually becoming much more susceptible to disease. There was an outbreak of typhoid fever during the 1300s that killed a huge amount of children and the elderly. Not, in, not to mention the fact that it also devastated the trade markets. Due to the fact that the High Middle Ages was so prosperous, it was also known as the High Middle Ages because people were making more money. Trade expeditions were going all over the world, and right before 1300, new ship designs led to people actually being able to trade year-round. Not just with Westerners, but even with Easterners over in China. You see where this is going? Calm down. I know you see the plague coming on. So, again, climate change was a big problem. Whoa! Whoa! Not that kind of climate change. So anyway, climate change was a big problem and it's gonna to lead to a lot of die off. It's gonna hurt the growth of trade and also it's gonna hurt that giant population increase. Well, we know that this actually happened for a fact due to, yeah, that's right, there's proof. All right, so we know that it happened due to like, we've actually noticed in tree rings from petrified wood deposits. We actually have ice core samples from glaciers that show the actual great drop off in the temperatures and the great expansion of ice levels. And we also had these gigantic Viking villages that were abandoned in Greenland. So you should be seeing a graph right now that shows where all of these Viking settlements were abandoned. And they're known as being the people that can handle the cold, but they actually left because it got so cold that they couldn't even survive there. So <clears throat> going forward though, this climate shift is gonna lead to something in the 1300s that actually is gonna help lead up to a bigger disease that you know of as the Black Death, okay? This thing, this event called the Great Famine that lasted from 1315 to 1322 is going to cause a massive die-off of like poor citizens, a huge amount of starvation, and also a giant increase in prices of goods and services because there's less of them around. As we all know, how economics works, if the supply is down, the demand is up, right? So the fact that all of these oat, hay, wheat, barley reserves that were dying and their harvest weren't as good, they were too expensive, poor families couldn't afford them, and so they actually are gonna lead to a lot of people dying off due to starvation. And then a lot of you are saying, well, wait a minute, why don't you just go out there and eat some meat? It's not a big deal. There's like cows running around. Well, also during the Great Famine, a huge disease came through and wiped out a lot of the livestock populations, including goats, sheep, and <clears throat> cows. There actually were accounts of cannibalism during the High Middle Ages during this Great Famine. So 
with the fact that you're not eating as much, it means you have lower calories, you have increased susceptibility to disease, you also have a lower work output, and then also you've got a huge amount of death between your young and elderly populations. This is also going to lead to a high amount of social consequences. Now the fact of the matter is a lot of people were abandoning villages because they didn't have anything to eat. A lot of them were turning into these things called vagabonds. A vagabond is a person who walks and wanders to try and find work. Well, if you have people wandering to try and find work, now you also have reduced marriage rates. And if you have reduced marriage rates, that means you don't have as many people being born. Because remember, they were a Catholic society. They believed in people being married to have children. Not saying that they didn't have children out of wedlock, but I'm just, you understand what I'm getting at. So <clears throat> that also means that there was restrictions of people's ability to deal with one another. There actually grew a large amount of hatred between the Christian areas and then against people like the rich, the speculators is what they were called, and then also the Jewish community. The Jewish community actually mainly because they were known for doing one, one of a few specific occupations. Christian communities wouldn't allow them to own land, so one of the big things that they got into was money lending. So the fact that they were lending this money out and then there was reduced crop output, which means these poor made less money, leading to an increased amount of hatred and anti-Semitism in this fairy tale of anti-Semitism that is going to sweep through Europe, kind of started in this like, Middle Age time period. So a lot of this also came from what was called torture evidence, where they actually tortured Jews into saying that they were doing it on purpose. And that's what they used as formal proof that all this was actually going on. A lot of kings are going to try to make reforms as well by trying to set prices for, and standards for things like goods and services, but it's going to fail miserably, leading to a large distrust in their government as well. So, all of the great, the great famine just set the stage for another terrible thing, the Black Death. All right, The Black Death is going to be a huge disease that sweeps through Europe in 1347. The Black Death is actually not even necessarily the sickness that you get when you actually contract a different thing called Yersinia pestis, all right? Yersinia pestis is the bacteria that causes the disease known as Black Death, all right? And the reason why is, of course, because due to all these ship improvements, or excuse me, it's not known as Yersinia pestis and all that stuff, but the reason why the Black Death was able to hit Europe so hard after the Great Famine was because of all these massive ship improvements. The fact that the world was able to actually trade all year round is going to make it so disease spreads that much quicker. We notice even today in modern era that diseases spread much faster via transport. Things like AIDS and H1N1 actually were transported first through uh, air travel. So anyway, but continuing forward, the pathology of the disease itself is something we need to understand. Okay? As we all know, you've learned about this stuff before, but it's important to understand what it does to your body. It's important to understand what it did to Europe. It's also important to understand the major reactions that Europe had to it, right? So, first and foremost, what normally is Yersinia pestis, this bacteria, usually affects rats, and it only affects rats, typically because people and rats try their best not to live together. Now, the problem was, though, is that if there are a less smaller amount of rats for the fleas to feed off of and live on, the fleas are actually the thing that spread the disease, right? Not the rat itself. You can get it from being bitten by a rat, but it's very unlikely. So the rats, though, are going to actually have massive die-offs rates because people don't like living with rats. And this is also not the first time that this outbreak of a disease has been seen. Actually, in the Byzantine Empire in 541 AD, I believe it is, the plague of Justinian was hit as well. And we believe that that actually was an outbreak of Yersinia pestis because of the massive extinction rates of rats that were going on in the cities in the Byzantine Empire, especially in Constantinople. And that plague actually killed 5,000 people a day, and we don't even have accurate numbers on how many people it killed in total. So, <clears throat> continuing forward, though, a lot of people think it might have been a strain of Ebola, but most historians agree that it was probably Yersinia pestis. But the bodily effects that you usually get when you actually contract the plague, the first one is when you get this thing called a bulbous, a B-U-L-B-O-U-S, a bulbous. It's a very, very large infection, almost ping-pong or golf ball-sized infection on either your neck, your groin, or your armpit. Now... It also, in Latin, though, is going to be called a bubo, and bubo actually is going to give it the name bubonic plague, right? Now, the only way that you could hopefully actually avoid the bubonic plague was if one of those creepy bird doctors actually came to your house and did what was called lancing the bulbous. By lancing it, they would cut that bulbous open and try to drain out all of the pus and fluid and blood and bleh, that was actually inside of it. And if you could get it out in enough time, you usually could like actually avoid it. 
However, a lot of the priests that are also going to be going to do this, and a lot of the nuns, and a lot of the other people that helped and wanted to help out, it's actually going to end up helping the disease spread. So anyway, now the Black Death, though, it earned its name mainly from the giant big black spots you get all over yourself because that's called lenticulation. Lenticulation is when your blood gets so poisoned by the bacteria that it actually, be your body begins to try and reject that bad blood, leading to subdermal hematomas, known as lenticulation, which is these big black spots all over you. And eventually you'll end up <coughs> coughing that stuff out into the air. Now when you cough it out into the air, now you're transferring it in the pneumonic plague fashion, because you're coughing out small droplets of blood, and people around you are breathing it in, which means they have just contracted your Yersinia pestis, and now they're going to get the Black Death, right? So as you can see, the plague was very easily spread. The fact that these rats were dying off and these fleas were biting people, because one of the really cool things about a flea, I don't know if you know this, but when they bite you, and they actually go like this, bleh, and then they actually throw up and regurgitate the bacteria into your person. So that's how you would get the bubonic form. The bubo form was like direct flea bite, or you'd get the pneumonic form, which is actually being inhaled. So anyway, now usually after you got the lenticulation, you would die two to three days later. And we actually know that the spread came from rats on transports, but also there's another possibility, it was because it was weaponized by the Mongolians. We don't know who Patient Zero was for the, excuse me, we don't know who Patient Zero was for the Black Death because it was so long ago, and as you know, the Middle Ages didn't record a lot of stuff. Uh, we, but we do know that the Mongolians actually attacked a small city on the Mediterranean called Kaffa. And Kaffa was actually going to be bought by the Italian city-state known as Genoa. All right, so in Genoa, when they bought Kaffa, they were actually attacked by the Mongolians, and the Mongolians used catapults to huck diseased plague bodies into the city. And that's because the Mongolians contracted the plague from the Chinese, which is where we believe it originated in the early 1300s. So the fact that the people in Kaffa tried immediately to get the plague bodies out was ill-fated and not a good attempt because they had already ended up catching the plague anyway. And so a boat is going to be moving from Kaffa back to Genoa and to Sicily, and it is going to make landfall in Europe in 1347. By 1348, ships are going to continue to go out, and it's going to end up hitting Venice and Rome, and then it's going to continue to go out, and by 1349, it's going to hit France and Britain, and then by 1350, it's going to even be so far ahead that it's going to affect Scandinavia. So transportation is going to be the reason why it spread so quickly, but it might have actually gotten to Europe due to weaponized plague bodies. So anyway... The other big thing, in fact, the reason why it was so easy to spread is you would think that once it hit the cities, oh, well, let's lock them up, we'll board up their house, maybe we'll burn it down or something like that. It'll actually keep us from all dying out. Well, actually, the conditions in the cities in Europe were perfect for the plague to spread. There was human feces in the streets. The streets were very narrow, which meant going in and getting dead bodies out was a big problem and not very easy. Also, there was like dead animals and waste everywhere. It was disgusting. So it actually made it very simple for the plague to spread. Also, <clears throat> not to mention the fact that the Great Famine had actually caused frightfully low hygiene and health rates. So the death totals of the plague, we actually don't know for sure. But we do know that we're, most historians estimate about one out of every three people in the world died, including China, Mongolia, and other parts of Southeast Asia, and some even in North Africa. And then we believe that 50% of the population of Europe is actually not even going to bounce back. And this is also, again, not the first and last time the plague has popped up. The plague has popped up in the 1600s in London in 1666. It actually killed over 100,000 people in London. It actually has also popped up in... Uh, 1890s in India and China, and we believe that there's chances that it may have actually even popped up in, what's it called, Vietnam after the 1970s. So the big effects that the plague is going to have on Europe in total, though, most importantly, is going to be on the economy. Now, the main thing about the economy is, as of today, historians are not sure if it was positive or negative. It could have been positive in the sense that it actually reduced the population back down to a much more manageable rate. Because of that great climate increase leading to those high crop outputs in the high Middle Ages, the economy really had a hard time keeping up. The fact that now all these people had died off during the Great Famine and during the uh, Black Death is going to lead to higher pay for work. It's also going to lead to men grouping up more into what is called guilds. A guild is an actual craft guild where men come together to learn a specific type of artisan craft, like smithing or carding or cobbling. And that had been established in the High Middle Ages. And so now they're going to see a giant resurgence of recruiting because so many middle-aged men from the age of about 18 to like 29 had died off so quickly. 
So also, it may, however, have devastated trade markets because leading to the fact when people realize that we don't have as many people to ship goods, we don't have as many people buying goods, and so it could have been the negative of the play could have been that it really, really hurt the trade economy. Now, religious effects also, though, is it's going to turn the Catholic Church into much more of a beacon of faith. The church going, or the, what is that word I was looking for? The parish, I guess? Uh, no, the, it's like a church community. It starts with a P, I swear. Um, now, anyway, but people are going to go to church more because they believe that God actually was enacting vengeance upon them. And not to mention the fact, too, however, which was really unfortunate, a lot of really, really good priests, monks, and nuns died due to the Black Death because they stayed back to try and help the sick. So you had a lot of, like, deaths among the, like, Catholic community, but also the Catholic community's monasteries and convents are going to begin to consolidate together, leading to some of the very first universities in the uh, actual Europe. So higher education could have been born or increased out of the plague. Not like the first university came because of the plague, but the output of the universities could have increased during the plague. So the other massive negative religious effect was also the persecution of the Jewish people. Now, this is not like, the, like I said, the anti-Semitic views actually started during the early of the early portion of the late middle ages but this is also going to increase because the fantasies of people actually saying that the jews were poisoning well waters so <clears throat> the last thing that's kind of a fun fact is flagellism flagellism were these roaming groups of people who actually went around europe and beat themselves as a self-inflicted form of penance because they thought pain would be a way to avoid the plague some of them actually ended up getting the plague though because of the open wounds that they actually left on their body now the other big aspect that was affected was the literature and art movement well, art is going to become obsessed with death. So is literature as well. Many poems released during this time period are going to become obsessed with death. All right? So then you had, like, death macabre art, like the Dance of the Dead, which is all these skeletons dancing on someone's grave. So this is also, though, going to lead, like I said, to the founding of many universities and a higher education system. So what we're going to get into next in the next flip, I hope I did better in this one. I tried to slow down. I tried to keep the time to a little bit shorter. But what we're going to talk about in the next one is the Hundred Years' War, and then possibly a little bit of the Catholic onslaught with the Great Schism, and then we're going to discuss that. I'll probably hopefully post that in the next day or so. You don't have to do them both at the same time, but there will only be two of them. And then we're going to finish up the Middle Ages the first couple of days in class. We're going to have a large quiz on that stuff, and then we're going to get right into the Renaissance. So I hope you all are enjoying the last bit of your summer. I'll see you all later, AP.